Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. My name is Ollie, and I'm doing the intro this week, kind of out of the blue. We've got some technical issues going on, so Sean is maybe on his way, maybe he's not. It might just be me and Ashley today. It might just be the three of us. We don't know yet, so we'll find out as we go. But uh, this show is brought to you by Order Clothes, a vanilla soft company. And with that, normally Sean will pass me to do the introduction to my guest, but I'll carry on. I'm with my good friend Ashley Early. And she's an expat from the States who's now in, um, oh, Ashley, help me. Um, you're not, are you in Amsterdam or not? <laughs> no, I'm just south of Amsterdam, but I'm in the Netherlands, also in the province that is known as Holland, specifically the, South Okay, Holland. I could have said Holland, Netherlands. I chose to get specific and I got it wrong. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. It's, I mean, it's, I'm 30 minutes south of Amsterdam. I'm 10 minutes north of The Hague and I'm, tw- I'm 30 minutes north of Rotterdam. So it's, it's what we call the area de Randstad. It's all very compact. So thoughts on what the area is like? It was it now about a year and a little bit you've been there? Yep, um, almost two years. Coming up my two-year anniversary, which is exciting because that means I get to renew my visa. Yay! Oh, all that fun stuff. Yeah, I remember uh, the fine. pain that you had on the way out, getting rid of everything it, it, and yeah. getting the documentation, all that stuff. Yeah, well, Genius Ashley decided to emigrate to another country in the middle of COVID. So if you're going to emigrate, definitely do it during a global pandemic. It's wretched. Don't do it. Um, yeah, but no, we, honestly, a year and a half in, uh, basically everyone, everything everyone told me would go wrong, didn't. And everything that no one told me about did. So it's definitely been an adventure, but I, I absolutely love the Dutch. They've been nothing but delightful and welcoming. Honestly, I've had virtually no bad experiences with anyone. Um, I love it here and it's been fantastic and I can and I'm working on getting more. So we're getting there. It's It's been a great adventure and we really feel very at home here, which is nice. Good. Well, glad to hear it. I'll have to come over at some point and see yes, you do. The, the area kind of stuff. But John um, can come too. If he can connect, but we'll see. But um, all right. So um, let's get into it. How did you describe what you do now? What, what is your terminology? Because I feel like it's a little bit, you know, I'm not a consultant. I'm not yeah, a trainer, but but we have to make sure we get this right. So so how do you describe what you do? Yeah. So I kind of my tagline on LinkedIn and stuff like that is a sales cheerleader, coach, and consultant. So what that means in practicality is my business has really three lines of business. I have my consulting business, which is where I work with companies to build, rebuild, troubleshoot their revenue engines. I have the training line of business where I partner with companies like uh, Winning by Design and NUMA, where I help them deliver their content through engaging sessions to their clients. I'll also do individual training sessions on specific topics that people might have. And then the third line of my business actually is the one that I launched this year, um, rather excitingly, which is a new thing kind of in response to the, the, at the request of several of our clients, I would do consulting gigs and they would be like, hey, we're really struggling with our sales engagement software and you're really good at this stuff, can you just stay on and manage it for us? Basically as kind of a fractional sales ops. Um, it's, it's half sales ops, half enablement in most cases. And that's actually grown pretty steadily to the point where I actually this year hired my husband to help me out with that part-time. So we're slowly but surely growing, but those are kind of the three kind of table legs of the business that have evolved over the years. And it's definitely not what it was when I first started. When I first started, it was all consulting um, with a little bit of like fractional leadership stuff here and there. So when you started just consulting, um, how did you get those first gigs? Uh, What were they like? Was it like one big company? Was it three or four of, you know, a smaller deal size to keep the cash flow coming in? Or or what was the kind of lay of the land? Yeah, well, I have to put context around again, like similar to like, let's, you know, let's immigrate during a global pandemic. I also started my consulting business literally four weeks before lockdown started. So wonderful timing. Yeah, I'm just killing it on the timing front. But basically what ended up happening to me in late 2019, literally, I think it was December 19th, I got laid off and that layoff was my fourth layoff in three years. So it basically kind of shook me a bit to my core. And I was like, I can't keep doing this kind of this wheel of join a company, build something. And then they hire someone at half my rate to keep running it longer term. So I was, so consulting for me originally was here's how I'm going to pay the bills while I step back for a minute, get some perspective and figure out what I want to do next slash when I grow up. 
And the intent was that I do it for no more than six months. So I set up a business. I incorporated it. Literally, I think it was, I think it was January 17th. It was finally approved. And then the pandemic hit the first week of March. The pandemic hit literally two days after I got back from a business trip from a training gig. So my first clients were primarily actually people who went to my former employer and went, wait, where'd Ashley go? And then reached out to me and said, hey, they said you left. And I said, no, they decided to lay me off. But that means that I am available for you to hire. Um, But most of them, at this point, I was doing primarily kind of SDR leadership and SDR coaching. So at this point, I found two or three founders who were struggling with how to run their SDR team. And I'd been kind of informally helping them with that. So we just formalized those relationships of, okay, rather than me just helping you as an add-on to what I was doing in my previous role, we're going to formalize that. I'm going to charge you, but I'll take on more responsibility as well. So it was kind of, I had two or three fractional kind of SDR leader type roles for companies where it's a 10 person or less company and they have one or two SDRs. And then a lot of it was also just letting my network know I was open for business. Um, so there was a, um, there were a couple companies that I actually did some ghostwriting for during that time as well. So getting my, dipping my toe in the content pool, learning how to write blogs that drove activity and stuff. I actually had a couple blogs published on, on Vanilla Soft, AutoClose, um, early on in those days as well. So that was a great learning experience with the infamous Daryl Prale. Um, and it kind of grew from there. I started figuring out over the course of 2020 what sort of work not only was I good at, but paid the best, <laughs> people saw the most value in, but also that didn't drain me. So a lot of the contracts I took initially, I enjoyed doing. It was great work, but it was just a lot of stuff that really left me exhausted at the end of the day. Whereas now I'm able to focus on, okay, great. This not only pays well, but it doesn't kind of eat my soul. So I have some energy left. I can go live my life and stuff like that. Good stuff. Okay. Um, I wanted to um, take you back a little bit. I-, I was going to ask, when you started doing these various separate gigs that you had, and I imagine uh, we can get to um, a bit more of a current state of play, but did you find it quite hard to maintain like a focus and a productivity about it, especially if the workflow comes and goes? Because I can, I'm picturing you sat there with like three or four gigs simultaneously, and you're kind of like, right, I've got to do this task, that task, but also three tasks here. Due date tomorrow, due date Friday, like, and you've got to manage your work timing. You've got to deal with all of it at once. Was that difficult, or, or did you manage to plan it out really well? No, it's it was brutal. Um, and what I found really interesting was in my previous role, right before I moved into this, I was doing heavy consulting. So I was responsible for coaching or sorry, heavy coaching. And I was responsible for anywhere from 10 to 35 people a week. So that was a, a lot of context switching, but it was very quick. I didn't have to be super deep on any one person, any one company. I knew generally what was going on with everybody. I could manage it pretty easily. What was a problem though, was when I moved into consulting, I had like six to seven projects going on at any given time, but they were bigger chunks. So instead of having a 30 minute call that needed five minutes before and after prep, I had a two hour block of time. And for some reason, just mentally, I found that much more draining than my little quick things. And I think part of it was because it was a lot of new motion. Um, Previous roles in sales leadership and SDR leadership I would do a lot of coaching, coaching something I'm very comfortable doing, training something I'm very comfortable doing. I'm comfortable doing strategy. I'm comfortable doing analysis, but I've never done it for six hours straight. So for me, it was more the type of work needed to be approached differently and figuring out how to get these kind of deep work sessions in our mix with all the client meetings that needed to happen took honestly about six months to feel like I had a handle on it. And then I decided to move. So then I was trying to figure out how to do that while I'm moving into a hotel and then moving in between hotels every three weeks, waiting for my visa to get approved. Um, So it was it was a lot where I finally really hit my stride with that stuff was really this year, um, really kind of early 2022. I kind of figured out the new system that I've been using, which is a combination of calendars um, to daily to do lists. I got my sticky notes. 
as well as um, I have color coded journals that I use. So I've got like my here, show and tell. So I've got a client for I've got a book for one of my major clients. So they have at least half my time. So they get their own fancy journal, which is actually almost done. Actually, both these are almost almost done. And then this is my catch all for everything else. So each one of those has that. I really am a fan of the Cornell style of note taking, which is where you divide your page into three. And basically like the top. So it's kind of hard to illustrate, but if you Google it, you can see it. So I've got my notes in one section. I've got my to do actions off to this. I've got my questions off to the side. And then at the bottom, I've got my summary and action items. So that way I can flip through things really quickly, know exactly what happened when and where. Um, I think it's worth mentioning too, actually, I went through a huge push in starting in 2019 and I abandoned it in the middle of the move around trying to digitize my note taking. I just really fought to try and find a way that worked to make my notes searchable and a catalogable and all these other things to try and digitize them. And I never found anything that worked for me. And finally, someone kind of late 20, late, uh, tw late 20, tw late early 2021 actually was like, Ashley, you know, you don't have to digitize it. If pen and paper works for you, just stick with what works for you. And then that's I was like, me as well. Oh. I've tried that. I tried Trello. I do click uh, project management tools. I do a Word doc, Notepad, Notion, yeah. anything you want. I tried it. Like It sticks for a week because I'm like mentally tuned to it. But then after that, I just think, eh. And then it gets out of date and it's done. But paper, because it's like physical... You know, I've, I've got it and I have to take it off. Otherwise, I look at it and think, oh, my God, this is too much. But my, on my must-do underlying list is five things. So I'm Lined right. sticky notes. These are my, like, everything. I've got four or five pads of these on my desk at all times. So I've got, like, my to-do list, which is my focus. No, you have to get this done today. And then I nest that with kind of anytime something comes up on a client call or whatever needs to happen that's not today. It goes on this. And I've got, like kind of embarrassing but like literally i've got just piles of <laughs> but the good news is i'm looking at them every day or two and would it make sense to anyone else no does everything get done on time 99 percent of the time yes so don't at me it works and, and, and that's, that's one of the things too really. i'd say to anyone who's listening don't try to it's about finding the system that works for you not the system that's instagram perfect like I do trainings with people on how to use project management tools and how to organize yourself and all this other stuff. And I'm teaching things that I have tried and I know for a fact don't work for me. But that's the thing. I've tried it. I know they don't work for me. And I'm still constantly trying new things and stuff like that. So like I've been experimenting kind of off and on with bullet journaling and trying to use that sort of task management system and there are elements of it that work really well and there are elements that don't. So I'm still trying to play with, okay, what exactly am I going to pull from that methodology to try and maybe improve what I've got going? So. All right. Yeah. So we're a little bit over time, but have you got another five, maybe 10 minutes? I've got a couple more things yeah. I wanted to ask. Let's if go. You can. Okay, cool. So uh, where are we today? What's different from the beginning? Uh, those, those first few, first, I can't actually speak at the moment. That's that's how different things must be. What's different from the first few gigs to today? Um, couple things. One, um, I think the biggest thing is I fell into consulting by accident. I never really chose to do this, and. What that's turned into is me recommitting and being intentional about, no, I'm going to build this business. This is the lifestyle I want to lead. So there's an intentionality behind what I'm doing now that was not present in the first year of this business. The other thing I think that's really changed is I've really started to zero in on the value that I can provide that very few other people can. And the net result of that is when I get contracts now and I start I did this in a kickoff call last night and it was a fast sales process they needed help right away it was a bit of a tricky sell with some leaders I got challenged on my rates I got challenged on deliverables can you actually do this and I go in the meeting and I just start being myself and doing what I do and asking hard questions and I had three people email me in while the meeting was still going on saying oh thank goodness you're here 
So the impact that I'm delivering is going up as, as a result of that. And that's really empowering and really satisfying. And that makes up for like all the craziness around taxes and figuring out how to handle my US entity and my, my Dutch entity interacting with each other and getting frustrated about having to change accountants in the middle of tax season and all the other kind of BS that we deal with as entrepreneurs. I'm seeing that impact grow and that's really exciting. That, I think that's a really difficult thing to do and, and it sounds like you've done a good job of it and I think it, it's like a continual thing, isn't it, for the most part? Yeah, but it's like, going to keep um, being a challenge. Get if I was to try that. and do that, I think I would land that because I was, I think of it so literally and, and figuratively. I would say, well, I don't want to have 10 clients. I want to have two. So then I'm forcing myself to have two big clients. And then I'm wrapping myself around that. And then that's not the way that you've done it. You've done it in terms of I'm specifically nuancedly good at A, B, and C, not D, E, and F, which I'm also good at. I'm specifically good at A, B, and C. And, and who would that fit for? And then how would we work with them based on that and their situations? It's I'm kind trying, of the way I've seen you go about that. I'm trying to do that. The problem is that the space where I am best is not a large market. So it's, okay, how do I find the people who are in this specific situation and need the specific skill set that I've got? But at the same time, let's take a look at B, C, D, and F because these pay reasonably well. And how do I get a steady stream of those going? So like if you talk about you've got three clients going on at all times, or you've got two big clients going on. The problem with that is should anything happen to either one of those clients, there goes half your income. So I'm at that kind of like three to five contracts at a time is a pretty good spot for me with one or two big ones that take most of my time and two or three smaller ones that are just constantly cycling in and out. So for me, it's also looking at the balance of kind of the bit, the, the whales and the minnows, as it were. It's just like a sales pipe. It's got to be a balanced client pipe. It's got to be a balanced sales pipe. And that's how I get a little bit more predictability in what I'm doing. And I also avoid getting ridiculously oversubscribed or, ah, how am I going to pay my bills? Which luckily hasn't happened yet, touching wood. But it's finding that kind of that balance a little bit. And I, I hit a little bit of that bump. I had a huge client that no longer needed my services and I didn't start ramping up that prospecting effort quickly enough. So it was like, oh yeah, sales. I probably should have seen this coming. But finding that mix of the big and the smalls is, is a little bit tricky. It's something I'm going to keep fine tuning. All right. My, uh, my favorite question last, we kind of hinted at a couple, but uh, I'm hoping there's like a big hairy terrible story here that you've got for me any mistakes you're willing to share whether it be about like the change in uh, in your location and the type of work you were doing i imagine obviously with that many moving parts there were a couple of problems but in terms of running your company wise anything yeah. you're willing to share honestly uh it's a mistake. Luckily, it doesn't. It, this is going to sound like it's a giant mistake. It's not. But what it is, I, it's a mistake because of how much stress I gave myself unnecessarily. Um, and that's be proactive with your taxes and your tax people and hire good people to do it. It's worth it to hire the people who are good at it to get it done and get it done right. Um, I got really scared this year about, oh, gosh, U.S. and Dutch and oh, my gosh, all this stuff's going to happen. And there were some major delays on the Dutch side, but as a result, I ended up scrambling and I hired an accountant that did not do a good enough job. And I had to switch last minute to a different person. And it just, it's been six months of stress. Whereas if I had just spent a little more money, done a little more due diligence initially, I would not have had to worry about it for the past six months, which would have invaded and it would have saved me a ton of time I could have spent on a bunch of other stuff. So don't mess with the taxes. Hire a professional. Hire a good one. Pay the money. Pay the money for the good one. And then just let it go. There's um, hospitalization. There's snakes. And then there is taxes for me. These two are down there. Taxes is up there. I don't know why. Just if I get that brown envelope through my door and that's the, in England, that's the, you know, the inland revenue are talking to you because it's, it's always that. Yeah, I would hate that feeling. You get the blue envelopes in the Netherlands. If you see that, it's just like, ugh. Yeah. Even though normally it's nothing. It's just, here's a report of your status. But yeah, it's that it's that moment of panic that I wish I had just owned up and owned it, owned that a lot earlier. Fair enough. Well, Ashley, thanks very much for coming on. It's been ages since we caught up. I think the last time we 
were out for dinner in London, which was um, I know a long You're time a ago. Uh, giant. Yeah. <laughs> when was but that? I don't even remember. It was that was last March December? because yeah, that was March. I think I I think I got COVID literally the day after I met you because oh, I got sick my first day back. Cause I was in, I was in London for a wedding. And so I saw Ollie and then I went to the wedding the next night. I'm pretty sure I got COVID at the wedding. Cause 72 hours later I had COVID, but that was great. I, Cause I got uh, to text wow. Ollie and say, Hey, sorry. Cause I don't know where I got it. So that was fun. I think I escaped it. I got it later in did. June or July. So that's weird how, yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know how, that, how I got away with that, but <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm sure we'll have to catch up again soon, but before you go and uh, thanks very much for your time so far, where can people follow you, find out more about what you do? And, uh, and what kinds of things are you up to these days? Any any podcasting or like any particular content you got coming out? Other Side of Sales is still going. Other Side of Sales is the podcast devoted to making B2B sales truly inclusive so everyone can thrive. You can check that out at othersideofsales.com. We've got our, our sales census is going to be coming out in a few weeks. So please go to the website, sign up for our mailing list so you can be notified about the state of DEI on sales teams. You can also follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm sure they'll put the links in the bio, but on LinkedIn, just look for Ashley Early with the crazy spelling of Ashley. And on Twitter, it's Ashley at work, which is a super deep cut Star Trek reference for any of my other Trekkies out there. I, I thought it was just like a work joke. I know. See, exactly, but, right? Yeah, it's, like, okay, no, it's a reference enough. to an obscure comic called O'Brien at work. Right, okay. Awesome. I can see it went straight over my head so I'm, I'm going to move on from that one Ashley thanks very much for coming on I appreciate you I'm surprised we haven't had you on earlier so we'll have to do another one maybe about the other side of sales types of thing it's almost like another business for you so, um, it is another so we'll business. book that up and, uh, and with that everybody thank you very much for listening hope you enjoyed the show uh, if you don't mind leave us a 5 star review subscribe and we'll see you on the next one thanks folks